On June 27th, 1925, the Saturday Evening Post published an article that was titled The Cowboy and His Songs. It was written by an old-time trail-driving cowboy by the name of Will C. Barnes. I'd like to read a quote from that article. In the early days of the open range, with plenty of open saloons, every drinking place had a singer or two on the payroll to attract customers and liven up matters. Often they were women who sang songs in shrill, quavery voices, some highly sentimental, some sacred, and many vulgar. The most satisfactory of these saloon singers were colored men, mostly from Texas, who played guitars, banjos, or the violin and sometimes possessed really musical voices. These singers did much toward keeping up the range songs and spreading them through the cow country. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working cowboy west and beyond. My guest today is Dom Flemons. Dom Flemons is a Grammy Award winner and one of the founding members of the Carolina Chocolate Drops. He's a scholar of old-time American music, and he plays the guitar, banjo, harmonica, the quills, and the bones. I sat down with Dom in Elko, Nevada during the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering, and we talked about black cowboy songs. Here's Dom Flemons. Well, when we started out the Carolina Chocolate Drops, the idea that there was black participation in uh, old-timey music or bluegrass music and country music specifically, it was just very fragmentary, and it was it was really on the periphery because uh, I think through a variety of circumstances, uh, the black community just hasn't truly been acknowledged as being a part of the root of the music. Um, in terms of practitioners, it's always been a sort of... It's been sort of like the... The stuff that's on the fringes, because a lot of times uh, when you think of black music, you think of things like blues and jazz and and gospel music, and the idea of banjo playing, square dance music, and uh, folk music. It just has always been. It's always been something that's been considered more white music uh, socially, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, of course, there was. Um, there's. Socially, the black community has always been a progressively moving culture just because of the, uh, the really uh, overpowering legacy of slavery, African slavery. And in the course of changing styles, the communities moved away from the old ways. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say that things like the minstrel show turned black people off from things like the banjo, but... There really aren't a lot of actual references where someone says that. Um, it, more so, you hear moving away from the idea of being country or moving away from thinking nostalgically about the past just because the past is so... I mean, it, it's just so dodgy finding the positive aspects of America's past when it comes to black people. Of course, internally, within family communities, you'll find nostalgia for the past and, and an embracing of one's own culture. But uh, in terms of on the, out, uh, on the outreaches, you don't see that nearly as much. And so musically, uh, that, those styles kind of just all faded away. And as the turn of the 20th century came in, you started having recording companies that were uh, marketing the recordings out to specific ethnic groups. And so you had like Italian records and Greek records and records by uh, Yiddish theater performers and whatnot. And 
around the, I think the end of the 1920s was when you had the establishment of race records, which is derived from a term that that black people were using at the time. It was a uh, when you were when you were trying to be uh, better than the generation that came before you socially, it was called uplifting the race. And so black people were known as the race. So race records became black music. And then after that, hillbilly, which is a, a term that's also uh, in, in the rural white communities, is a term that's not really a badge of honor, but it just kind of it got added in because there was a group early on, Al Hopkins and his hillbillies. And so the term hillbilly ended up being the title for what we now think of as country and western. And so when we started the Carolina Chocolate Drops, it was, it was something that we just tried to tell people the stories that we had read about in the books, because there happened to be just a lot of stories of African Americans in the background that led to the pioneers of country music. And so you had people like, there was a guy named Arnold Schultz, and he was a musician out of, uh, I believe he was in Mecklenburg, Kentucky, and he used to travel out to New Orleans and listen to the jazz bands out there, and then he would do his seasonal work, and then he'd come back to Kentucky, and he developed a guitar style that incorporated a lot of those aspects of jazz. And so he taught a lot of the white musicians in his community, and, you know, to get a list of the people that were influenced by this guy Arnold Schultz included Bill Monroe and his brother Charlie. It includes um, Ike Everly, who was the father of the Everly brothers, Merle Travis, and uh, Chet Atkins. And uh, just those are kind of the stories that, you know, I kept finding these when I would be looking up just the different information on all these pioneers of country music. Hank Williams had a guy he knew named Old T-Top Payne, who was a fellow who was a black musician locally around the corner from him in Alabama. And T-Top kind of showed Hank the first chords that he learned on the guitar. And that's something that was always prevalent in Hank Williams' music, is there's this sense of the blues, even though it's country music. Um, you also had a group like the Carter Family. And A.P. Carter, when he went to collect all these songs that he ended up recording with Sarah and Maybell, his uh, traveling companion was a fellow by the name of Leslie Riddle. And Leslie Riddle was a fellow who lived near the Carters, and he was a black man that uh, had polio, and he would just travel around with A.P. Carter collecting these songs. And A.P. called him his jukebox, so he would learn the melodies, and then A.P. would write down the words, and the two of them would create the material that the Carter family would record. And it's also said that uh, Leslie's guitar style... Uh, helped influence Maybell as she was developing her own guitar style. Of course, when you listen to the two of them next to each other, they they have certain aspects that are similar, but Maybell did her own thing to make what's now known as the Carter Scratch into the the sort of uh, the influential guitar country guitar style that we know now. Uh, so that was kind of the thing that we started out doing. We just would you know, pass along all of these stories that that we had heard about these country music performers, and then we'd incorporate it also with the things that uh, all of us collectively learned at the Black Banjo Gathering, which included uh, that the banjo is an African-derived instrument, that it was an instrument that had to do um, what uh, you call sankofa, which is a proverb in West Africa that means go back and fetch it, take the things from the past and take it into the present so that you can create a new future. And so we took those ideas and then we incorporated that into the music that we performed so that when people asked us why we played the music, because most of the time it'd be like, well, how did you, how did you start doing this? Why are you playing this? Because up to that point, most people had only heard uh, old-time music or most time people think of it as just bluegrass in general. They said, oh, well, how did you get into doing bluegrass music? I've never seen a black band do that. We could explain to them how there was a very long history that was wrapped up in this instrument. And then also it led to a bigger conversation about uh, race relations in the United States and how music can always break through barriers. So that was, that was how we, we started in doing all that sort of stuff. And, 
every aspect of American music, you can find some sort of form of African American participation. And it's all just about creating awareness. How did you make the leap from the you know, the African American influence on a, particularly the string band music and you know, the kind of hillbilly type things that you were highlighting with the chocolate drops to the notion of the black cowboys and the the black cowboy songs? Well, for me, the story of the black cowboys began about, I don't know, I'm going to say about 10 or 11 years ago. And I came across this CD called Black Texicans. And it was a compilation that featured John and Alan Lomax's field recordings of, of African-American musicians from Texas and uh, some of the early places where they were doing their field recordings. Because... John Lomax was aware that they were black cowboys in the sense that, just like with the string band music, when you go out to the South, the people that are black that are out in the South, they know they're there. And the people that are white that are out in the South know that the black people are there. But socially, there was a point where you couldn't really elevate a black person onto the level of a white man. And that was just the way people were. And sometimes they are. But... It was one of those things where these different uh, cowboys, they were very well respected, but they couldn't be given the full elevation to being a, a great person in the community just because it wasn't socially acceptable to do that. And so when I heard this album, Black Cowboys, uh, the, the Black Texicans, it, it really opened my eyes up to things that I knew in my own life to be true. Because being from Phoenix, Arizona originally, uh, my father uh, was, a, he grew up in a town called Flagstaff. And that's a, you know, I thought it was kind of country when I was growing up. But the town that uh, his grandfather, his father grew up in was a, a very rural town in Texas. It was called Pineland. And it was a, a town that just literally had just one sawmill in it. And everybody worked in that single sawmill. And of course, if you think about slavery and you think about Reconstruction and kind of the uh, emancipation of African American people before civil rights, you just got to remember that the labor force for everywhere featured a lot of African Americans. And so the cowboys were no exception. So then after I heard this CD, it, it may have been a couple years later, I came across a book called The Negro Cowboys. And The Negro Cowboys talks about the way that uh, about half of the cowboys that settled the West were black. And it's a very interesting, interesting story that changes the way uh, you can perceive cowboys because you don't ever see black cowboys in in movies, for example, not outside of being, you know, blacks being servants, not cowboys, or and stuff like that. But you find you find uh, that the story of the black cowboys was very prevalent, and that there were a lot of different types of stories. Uh, recently, I saw an article about Jack Daniels celebrating its 150th anniversary, and the story of Jack Daniels comes from so. Jack Daniels, he was he had a talent for making whiskey, and his mentor recognized that talent. And the story has always been, well, this mentor said, all right, Jack Daniels, I'm going to show you everything I know about making whiskey. And so for their 150th anniversary, Jack Daniels has expanded the story to what everybody's known in the, in the region and the local folklore is instead of the mentor saying, Jack Daniels, I'm going to show you this stuff. He actually said, Rufus, show Jack Daniels everything I know. And so this guy Rufus was this fellow's slave. And so just kind of thinking of the slaves and thinking of the freed black people as a labor force that was kind of like if we think of an iPhone now. Think of like an iPhone being 50 slaves. And that was the sort of way that people were at that point. It's like if you needed to get something done quick, you called upon your labor force to do all that stuff. And But once you make that labor force independent, they are all of a sudden extremely skilled at all of these talents, and they use them. The reason I bring this up is when I started reading about the Black Cowboys, when 
these uh, early, I would say, entrepreneurs uh, moved out west, they were the best bronco busters, and they worked as freelancers because in slavery they had spent so much time doing all of this work for free. This was the first time that they could get paid for any of it, and they took that to the extreme. And so you see a lot of stories of these amazing cowboys that came out that while they weren't socially accepted on the same level as white men that were settling, if um, being that they were the early pioneers and settlers along with many of the people, they got... I I don't want to say special privileges, but they got to do things that uh, black people in the East Coast wouldn't have been able to do because everyone had a bond as a pioneer uh, instead of it being, uh, I'm up here and you're down here. Everybody said, oh, we all pioneered this together, so there was a lot more leeway. One of the things I thought was the most interesting about learning about the black cowboys, well, All of my first exposure came from reading books or seeing uh, research that had been done about black cowboys. And I thought it was something that was really far away into the past and wasn't something that led up to the present. But when I first came out to Elko, I was was really blown away by all the different people who had done research. And and, um, Don Edwards, of course, was someone who... Uh, is a resource for all things cowboy and and that he is is one of the uh, main advocates for the black vaqueros uh, that's something that i was surp- i was surprised to see that so many people had done that and of course uh, you and you got me uh, educated in in partner of the wind the autobiography of jack thorpe and i hadn't necessarily heard of jack thorpe i'd heard of little joe the wrangler his very famous number but i didn't realize that jack thorpe's journey in song collecting began with black cowboys and so that idea that there were these black cowboys that were around um was something that it's just it, it's something that like again you get into the local folklore and everybody knows it but when you get into the broader spectrum of what people think of as cowboys and what a cowboy looks like or what a what a cowboy represents, uh, it becomes a whole different thing. So it's kind of one of those areas, just like with the string band music, where uh, to me it's all about just creating awareness, just really putting one little flag in there and saying, you know, this is a strong part of the history and it blows people's minds. And so when it comes to the songs, that's the thing that's the most interesting is that the songs don't necessarily change. You don't have to change any of the words to them, any of the ways that you play them. You might put little subtleties into it for performance sake, but the songs don't change, except when you get the picture in your mind who a cowboy is. Like when you think of a song like Little Joe the Wrangler, if Little Joe the Wrangler is a young little white boy and he's a young little black boy, those are two different stories that you're telling. Uh, without changing any of the words. Home on the range, the same sort of thing. Goodbye, old paints, another one that's like that. And it really just, it's all about the perception of what a cowboy can be. Because even for me, I always thought cowboys were white. I just, you know, I'd never seen anything that proved otherwise. Um, but it's one of those things that once you know about it, all of a sudden the it's like a tapestry that fills itself in. You've seen part of a tapestry, and then all of a sudden you put in this extra little paint into it and then all of a sudden it becomes this new vibrant tapestry that uh, gets you to reanalyze the entire thing like for me I, it's gotten me thinking about one that the, the the trail drives weren't as long as we think of like you know I don't know I had a perception that the cattle drives were like it was 50 years of cattle drives but actually it's like about I don't know maybe two decades worth before the the railroads come into it so all of a sudden the idea that there, there were so many black cowboys, isn't that strange? Because it's just only a couple of decades. And also if I, you think about Reconstruction and the, uh, the horrible things that happened to African American people during the Reconstruction era, socially, all of a sudden the cowboys take on this other aspect of why people were moving out west. I mean, there was Manifest Destiny, but Manifest Destiny was just to get out of the East Coast and try to build something new, just like the the first settlers came to the original 13 colonies looking for something new, getting away from England. But, you know, 
with adding the black cowboys and this idea, it all of a sudden expanded the, the whole notion of what a cowboy represents and stands for. Back before record companies started dividing music into categories and labels, the lines were not so clear between black and white music. I've heard it said that Lead Belly liked to sing Gene Autry songs, but was discouraged from doing so because it did not fit his image. Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music, was sort of a white blues singer, and his songs were heavily influenced by the music of African Americans. Mississippi John Hurt, the great folk blues guitar player and songster, was himself a big fan of Jimmy Rogers. I asked Dom to talk about the interchange between black and white musicians. Oh yeah, well you know, the interchange between black musicians and white musicians, one thing to always remember is that music is is a form in which you can get away with a lot of stuff that you couldn't get away with socially outside of musical performance. And especially in the South, uh, being not from the South originally, when I first started living out, uh, out, in, out in the South in North Carolina, I realized that there was this sort of contradictory idea that, of course, while racism can be prevalent uh, philosophically, socially, it's all about familial lines, and it's all about knowing your neighbor. And if you all go to the same church, there's a certain certain uh, jive around knowing where somebody's from. And so you can get away with a lot of stuff uh, with black and white interchange when you see that the people lived near each other. Because, of course, your neighbor, uh, your neighbor can help you in a time that... Uh, that you might be in trouble, and if you mistreat that neighbor, they can just as easily not help you. And of course, that's something that you find when you start looking at these early black cowboys, is that uh, you have these situations where all you had to do was not help somebody when they were in trouble, and then they'd have to fend for themselves. But, you know, obviously you want to make sure everybody's happy so that if something goes down... You know, you'll have your neighbor to help you out, and that includes how people think about uh, blacks and whites when it comes to very uh, tight situations where everybody's in the same sort of economic and social status. Uh, when it comes to the interchange between musicians, you see a lot of examples of this. Of course, Jimmy Rogers is a perfect example. Like, I'll show you one little lick here. Is Jimmy Rogers has this one lick that he does in every song, which is... So that's something that he does on almost every single song. Uh, Papa Charlie Jackson, who was a six-string banjo player out of New Orleans, and he lived in Chicago... He has all these songs that do the same thing, but he just does. And so that single lick, you've, you'll find that with black musicians and white musicians, just because people weren't thinking that hard about what type of music fit with the ethnic group. They weren't thinking that hard about it until you had records that said this is black music and this is white music so you had people stealing music from every which way just to make the type of music they need to and of course the audiences just like audiences now they really don't care that much about where you get a song from if they like the song they'll follow you and so that's something that musicians have always done they've always they've always taken ideas from here and there um, well, just to even take it out of the black and white idea, if we think of something like Hawaiian music, for example, uh, there was a, a generation of Portuguese uh, cowboys that came out to Hawaii that helped uh, wrangle the, the cattle out there. And in the course of it, there was this small little, I can't remember the name of the instrument, it was a small little uh, instrument that was a strumming instrument. And they say that this little Portuguese instrument slowly evolved into what we now know as the ukulele. We think of this as a Hawaiian instrument, but it, it has this root with Portuguese music. 
also at the same time, you had these Portuguese uh, ranchers come in with the guitar. And so over a, a long period of time, once you got this guitar in Hawaiian hands, they made a whole style of Hawaiian slack key guitar is what they call it. Uh, there was a fellow named uh, George Key Cuckoo who um, was passing by a railroad and he heard a nail. Uh, there was a nail that was on the railroad track that had bounced up and it hit a gu the guitar he was holding in his hand and it made this certain ring on the strings. So he was a little kid, I think he was about 12 or 13 or something like that, and the the sound that it made to him, it, it stuck in his brain and he decided to develop the guitar. He he made the lifted nut on it that that is so distinctive about Hawaiian music and then he became a vaudeville performer and performed all over the world. And this is where he was saying 1915, 1916. Fast forward maybe about a decade, black and white musicians took on this Hawaiian style of guitar playing, and it, it was something that became essential to country music in the form of the pedal steel, and it became essential to blues in the form of slide guitar. So, it, like, with it doesn't matter where it comes from. People are are always human beings. They have their, their ears, they take in those sounds, and they want to incorporate it into whatever they've got. So, you know, it's, when you think of black-white interchange, it's one of those things where music never stops people. It always, they'll, they'll go to every, uh, every length to get that music. When you talk about the black influence on cowboy songs, you're not just talking about some unknown, obscure songs. You're talking about some of the classics in the cowboy canon. Songs like Goodbye Old Paint, Old Chisholm Trail, and Home on the Range. Well, Goodbye Old Paint, that's the one that to me is still the most enduring story of black cowboys that you can find. Uh, there was a, a fellow by the name of Jess Morris, and he was a white fiddler and singer who recorded the song for the Library of Congress for John Lomax. And he did that in 1942. And Jess Morris always made a point of mentioning this cow, this cow hand, this black cow hand that worked for his father in the Texas Panhandle by the name of Charlie Willis. And so Charlie Willis, one of the things that Besides him being a great cowhand, one of the things that led him to be hired so many times to go up the trail all the way through Wyoming and uh, Abilene, Kansas, and back was that he had a great singing voice, and he had this one song he would sing, which was Goodbye Old Paint. And so I think Jess would, may have been like eight or nine years old or something like that, and Charlie Willis taught him Goodbye Old Paint. He was playing the juice harp and taught him how to play it. Fast forward a couple of years after that, another black cowhand by the name of James Neely, who was a fiddler, taught Jess how to play the fiddle. And so the foundation for Jess Morris's uh, musical background came from these black cowhands. And also the Mexican vaqueros. I can't forget forget about that. That's a, It's almost like seeing an island for the mainland if you think of the Mexican vaqueros or... We think about black and white cowboys being the small little island, and the Mexican vaqueros are the rest of the mainland, pretty much. If you think of America, that's how they sit. But Jess Morris loved working with black cowboys and also with Mexican musicians. And Goodbye Old Paint is one of the songs that, for him, was an enduring classic of, of the cowboy genre. And he continued to push that until the day he died. And now it's still one of the most well-known cowboy songs of all time. There's an, like uh, Home on the Range, for example, is a song that's linked with the Black Cowboys. Even though it was written in the, I think it was the 1870s it was written by uh, some obscure composer. But that's the thing that's beautiful about it is like we don't think about this original composer. The reason that everybody knows the melody of Home on the Range comes from this, this story that John Lomax tells about running into a black cook who worked at the saloon, who sang him this melody into his wax cylinder recorder. And that melody, John Lomax transcribed it and put it into his book. And now we think of Home on the Range. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. That's the melody that this black cowhand who worked as a cook sang to him. And now that's an enduring 
an, an enduring song that I think everybody in America knows it in some form or another. Even if they don't know the verses, they at least know the chorus. Um, a, another song that uh, that comes to my mind as well is the song Old Chisholm Trail. And that's a song that, I mean, a well-known song that every cowboy singer has sung and most people who know cowboy music have heard it one form or another it has a uh, what they call floating verses which are just um you know just random verses about this that and the other and then as the song became more popular on the range people made all sorts of verses about this river or this bar or this ranch or whatever and now there are like hundreds of verses and that's a, a song that it's like the blues. And that's one thing that Don Edwards told me when I first came to Elko the first year I played was he mentioned that, you know, cowboy music in some form or another, it's almost like an early version of the blues. It has uh, the same sort of couplets, has the same sort of improvisation, and has the same sort of uh, musical structure that makes the blues so enduring. And so when you think about when you think of cowboy music in that sort of way, it becomes a lot more interesting as a sort of a a uh, symbol of the musical diversity that we have in the United States of America, and that's that's something that I think is always amazing, you know. And I guess fast forward into the the singing cowboys, you know, after the the early the early years of uh, the tr the cattle trails you have these dime store novels that come out that romanticize the cowboys in a certain way and then you have these singing cowboys who are like uh, hollywood stars that took on the mantle of the cowboy of course gene autry is probably the most popular one that everybody would know but even when you listen to songs like uh, songs that gene autry recorded or a lot of those early cowboy groups they have this early jazz and ragtime sort of sound and to me I, I started to notice that cowboy music kind of became the way that white musicians could incorporate jazz into their music in a way that was acceptable because of course cowboys being uh, on the the lower side of the economic scale it just like the the early minstrels it it the image of the cowboy was able to give these sort of uh, white culture, which has always been a, a Victorian culture, very much a, a staid culture that's about, you know, being very uh, buttons all uh, done up on the collar and everything like that. It gave people this sort of conduit in which they could uh, find a new voice outside of that by using the image to, um, to uh, show just a different side of themselves that they might not have been able to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And cowboy music has that to it. There's a lot of washboards and there's a lot of banjos and whatnot in early singing cowboy music that I think, again, it, it speaks to this influence of the early black cowboys and early black culture mixing with white culture and, of course, Mexican culture to make this new sort of culture, American culture. That's just uh, wonderful stuff, Dom. Would you... Uh be willing to play a song for me to kind of wrap things up? Oh, sure thing. I... I play a little bit of Goodbye Old Paint, and I really fell in love with this song all over again in the course of learning it as I started researching the Black Cowboys. I'm a leaving shine. 
Goodbye, old pain, I am leaving Cheyenne. Cause old pain's an old pony, and she paces when she can. In the middle of the ocean, may it grow a green tree. But I'll never prove false to the girl that loves me. Old pain, old pain, I'm a leaving Cheyenne. Goodbye, old pain, I am leaving Cheyenne. Cause old pain's an old pony, and she paces when she can. We spread down the blankets on the green grassy ground And the horse and the cattle were all grazing all around Old pain, old pain, I'm a-leaving Cheyenne Goodbye, old pain, I am leaving Cheyenne Cause old paint's an old pony And she paces when she can Now the last time I saw her, it was late in the fall. She was riding old paint and leading old ball. Old paint, old paint, I'm a leaving Cheyenne. Goodbye, old paint, I am leaving Cheyenne. Cause old paint's an old pony And she paces when she can Old paint had a coat On the Rio Grande And the cold couldn't pace So he named her Cheyenne Old pain, old pain, I'm a leaving Cheyenne. Goodbye, old pain, I am leaving Cheyenne. Cause old pain's an old pony, and she paces when she can. Now my foot's in the stirrup. And the bridle's in my hand Oh, fair ladies, I'm a-leaving Cheyenne By my little donny, my pony won't stand Farewell, fair ladies, I'm a-leaving Cheyenne Bye, my little donny, my pony won't stand. Goodbye, my little donny, my pony won't stand. Goodbye, my little donny, my pony won't stand. That's beautiful, Dom. <laughs> Thank Thanks you, Andy. Doing that. <laughs>
<laughs> hey, thanks for taking the time to visit with me today. And hey, do abso- this. absolutely, Andy. You know, thank you for thank you for starting up this program. You know, like the the cowboy stories are. It's time for a new round of them. You know, uh, it's been what well, I mean. The Elko's been going on for thirty three years, but I think it's. I feel like the story of of the cowboys is is going to be a very galvanizing story for for the people in the United States. I, I feel like now more than ever, the idea of the cowboy and the togetherness and the pioneer spirit is something I think that people are really, uh, they're needing that, really needing that now more than ever. folks that's it for this episode i'd like to thank dom flemons for taking the time to visit with me you can find out more about dom at the americansongster.com you can find out more about me and this show at andyhedges.com if you'd like to help me keep this show going you could make a donation on the website or you could leave a review on the itunes store that helps more people find this show or you could take the time to Tell a friend about it, someone you think might enjoy the show, and encourage them to give it a listen. If you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads. <laughs>